Hello and welcome back to Zim Explore. I am Dr. Abstract and in this Zim Explore we're going to continue to take a look at the texture actives in Zim. This is a way that we can get Zim into 3JS. So let's go to the Zim site now at zimjs.com and here is a feature banner that features texture active and actually the texture active example that we're going to be looking at in this explore at <laughs> first let me let me reduce that music a little bit <laughs> the music of whatever <laughs> sea urchins or something all right um so texture active is a new zim class in zim 015 here so you can find it by pressing on the banner if you want or hitting the what's new the zim 05 and that brings you into the texture active area here uh, it is also available on the Zim site under the code section under libraries. We have Zim socket for multi-user game physics and here's three with texture active so all those features are available here and uh, then we had initially brought 3JS into Zim and we can still do that but now we're bringing Zim into 3JS actually kind of works a little better I think um, and then we have the pizzazz and the cam and the base those are helper libraries with Zim so you'll need the well you actually don't have to use a 3JS or you were going to use 3JS but you don't have to use a Zim 3 helper library we thought it was so important that you might want to just use raw 3JS but with uh, Zim and so we did not tuck everything away in the three helper class, although the three helper class will, as it says, help us. So I'm going to click here. And then the example that we're doing now is this one right here. We've done Zim bubblings showing through all of these, like a first bubbling showing these, a second bubbling showing these, and then a third bubbling on the code of this one. And we've also done a Zim Explorer on this one right here. And so now this is one we're taking a look at now where this model animates in. And we might have wanted to animate that model in at a bit of an angle. It's kind of flat and so you might not realize that um, it's even in 3D and that's why we put this little message drag everywhere to move the phone. And that was just an HTML overlay on this and it, then it goes away. So there's the model. We've got two um, Let's see, how do we do this? I can't remember. It might have been just two containers. Uh, I think we animated one in and animated the other one out in Zim. We're going to go explore that today. How exciting. But what we've done is we've overlaid that texture active. This is a texture active texture on a material that is just very close to the phone. Uh, you can't, it's just like almost right against the phone. So we didn't put it in the model, although we probably could put it in a model. We, if we knew the material in there, then where, where to put that. But anyway, um, we've just overlaid a plane on here. And the plane goes down this far, like that, so that Zim also can handle the button there. So even though we've got this orange box, the texture active material is, is a little bit bigger than that. And now we're going to press the button. Whoosh. And we crossfade then to a scrambler puzzle. So people who have used Zim are very aware of the Scrambler. It's a nice component that makes a puzzle like this, and we've been using it for interactive art. And so this is interactive, where we can drag this around like so. Uh, shall we solve it? So when we solve the puzzle, you ready? It knows it's solved, and then we do a Zim animation on that, and then we can pick that up again. But to run it again, we have to go to this. That scrambles it. It's very easy to make a scrambler. Um, I mean, doing that isn't terribly easy in code to start. It's maybe like 100 lines, maybe 120 lines of code of sort of complex stuff to, to handle scrambling like that. But we did bring that in as a component in Zim. It's been very handy for quick puzzles. It also works not on a grid like that, but... Um, in a line and so you can scramble things in a line that's that's very handy to have as well but as you can see that works uh, just wonderfully on uh, in 3js on there like that that's that's great 
Okay, well, why don't we then take a look? Oh, the other thing is that you can do is you can hit the T key, and I think this is the only texture active in there. And if that's the case, yeah, our texture active scroller is not doing too much, is it? But normally, if we have multiple texture actor actives, we would line them all up going right off the screen and use this to scroll. Uh, but note that that is also live, like so. Okay, I'll close that and it comes back again. All right, and again, it's live. You see how, let's see, what do we want to do? Let's bring that up to the corner. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Okay, so we've got that format. If I hit the T key, it's the same format in here. So it's live between the T uh, for the toggle. And I think we made the texture actives. Oh, in this case, we forgot. That's supposed to be a link. We could have easily made that a link. Maybe we can do it as we explore. And that link then would toggle these things. But uh, we forgot to do it in this model case. All right, let's go to some code now. And uh, close that and bring this down over here. Here is the file. It's called Texture Active 3. The last, the last explorer looked through Texture Active 2, and the bubbling code one looked through Texture Actives without a number. And we'll continue to do, bu uh, not bubblings, but um, explorers for the the next couple as well. Three, three more, I think. So we're bringing in Zim uh, with a module. So import Zim, but with underscore three. That will, by default, imports uh, 3JS revision 155 at the moment. So uh, that's the current latest as well. You don't have to bring in the three module, and we've got examples that are the raw versions. There's links to them here. So here's a raw version where we don't bring in three, and here's a HUD version with, that is also raw. We don't have a raw version with this, but you can see how we did the raw versions. And what I mean by raw is we only import Zim here, and then you grab 3JS from wherever you normally grab 3JS and how you normally uh, deal with 3JS. The helper will give us a few things. Since we're talking about it, let's just drop down and see what those few things are. This is how we make 3JS. Uh, this will make a scene for us, a camera, and a render. And we've just stored those in local variables. So there we go. That's that's what we mean by the helper. You don't have to worry about the, the render loop. Uh, you don't have to worry about setting up the render to the canvas, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some parameters here that you can pass, and there's documentations for that. In these parameters, you can say where your camera's starting, and you can also, uh, what is needed here is to put texture active true. That will stop it from uh, scaling in a certain way. Usually when we use the three module, we are putting 3JS into Zim, and how that does it is overlaps it onto Zim and scales it with Zim and so forth. Anyway, by saying that it's a texture active, that turns that scaling off. If you don't want any scaling, 3 also will handle the window scaling and make it all scale to the window. If you don't want any of that, you can say scaling false, and then it will. you can load 3JS into, I don't know, a div or something like that that isn't scaling at all. Um, and so anyway, these, these parameters are available. Why don't we go take a look in this explore as to where we can find those. So if we go to the Zim site now and uh, hit the docs right here, and then look up three, e e enter. Here it is right here, three width, height, color, camera position, camera look, uh, whether you want to. Uh, the interactive setting is when you overlay 3JS onto Zim and sort of bring 3JS into Zim, then you've got to choose, do you want the 3JS to be interactive or do you want the Zim to be interactive? And um, that would be only in the location of the 3JS. Usually we would have a, you know, a Zim app and then with a, a little 3JS part in it to rotate a model or something like that. Uh, if you want to use orbit controls on that model, then you would say interactive, and that would turn uh, the 3JS interactive. But in this case, uh, we assume that if you're texture active, then obviously the 3JS is going to be interactive, so that's fine. There's that resize we talked about and a few other things. Uh, in the HUD version, which we'll show you coming up in, a, in an explorer, 
there's an ortho camera as well, an ortho scene, and that will help you with your HUDs, and you can do both ortho and uh, regular perspective cameras. And then color space seems to be something new that, that's happening. Well, it's not new exactly, but uh, it's become kind of important and a little tricky in the latest versions of 3JS uh, requiring us to just, just make a change. Like we've had it done in a certain way. And now we have to pay a little bit of attention to that, and we'll get used to it again, I'm sure. But anyway, by default, I can't remember what it does with the, the, color, uh, the, the color space, uh, legacy lights. Um, true to turn on color management, and you can read about it here. So we've got some information on that. Okay, it looks like we got to add uh, a couple parameters too. So we'll get in there and add the legacy light and throttle. We didn't um, stick in the front here. Oopsies, what an explorer, huh? Uh, we can get that fixed up in no time. All right, um, but will I remember? Do you want to see it? Yeah, let's explore. Come on, we'll explore together. So I'm gonna open up my files over here. We want the CDN, which is just down here. So here's the CDN directory, 015. We want the doc version of this, which is right there. And look up uh, zim.3, T-H-R-E-E. -E. Uh, here it is right here, and we want two more parameters. What were those parameters called? They were called legacy lights and throttle after color management. Okay, color space. Let's just have a look there. Color space, ah, color management, legacy and lights. Color management, legacy lights, and whatever. Probably best to well, you know what, let's um, do that copy right from the code itself so I don't make a spelling error or anything like that. And that is, oh yeah, not in here because this is just the docs. Okay, well, we'll handle it then. Um, the helper modules have the docs in the docs, but the modules are actually uh, code in another place. So that was in socket. <laughs> what an explore. Where are we now? Okay. Uh, So it's color space, color management, the one we copied, and throttle, like so. So we had uh, since updated those with uh, three things and forgot to update it in there. Okay, save. And we upload that. And we come on over here. Oh, I, I do a secret command. I better not show you. Secret command. Boop. There, it says it's all done. Now close that and we'll refresh here and hit three. Okay, there it is. Color management, legacy lights, and throttle. Does that look good? Color management, legacy lights, and throttle. Color management, legacy lights, plural, and throttle. All right, that all matches up there. Okay, great. So that's where you can find information about the three helper file. And note that there's also all the links to the, the examples of both having uh, 3JS inside of Zim and Zim inside of 3JS. Do you want to see what that looks like? So if I, I press this, this is a 3JS model right here. And we're using Zim controls to uh, play around with that, to play around with the speed of it and so forth. That's one example. Here's another. Hey, I recognize that. That's <laughs> the same model that we're using. This is an older model and it's a similar kind of scenario as well where we're controlling the model, but this time, ooh, oh, that's a little bit different with, with uh, Zim. So this is a Zim color picker. And now you'll be able to bring in a color picker right into 3JS and, and you don't need it to be, well, this is kind of like a HUD version, but this is more Zim based with a bit of 3JS model. Uh, if you want Zim to be in your 3D world with you, which is actually very, very exciting, then um, it it's works the new way. Yay. And, but I'll show you one more. Here's, what's this one? Oh, this is up on CodePen, something similar where we're every time we flip it here. Well, oh, crap. 
the flip is being flipped outside of the iframe. But anyway, every time we flip it or we can use this thing, we can use a Zim indicator here to put different pictures on the model. So that was uh, that one. And the last one is this one, which is a code pen. I believe this one's a world. So yeah, these are code pen examples where we can use a Zim swiper on that world. And we also get Zim components up here to show you where various uh, craters are. Uh, it's not real. <laughs> We're making it up. Uh, I think there's even a Zim crater, if I remember correctly, somewhere in here. Yeah, there it is. Here's a Zim crater. Ah, all right. Yeah. All right, but that's a Zim list. And now you can bring that list into um, 3JS. You don't need to bring 3JS into Zim. All right, good. That was fun. Did you enjoy that? Explore. And let's, uh, by the way, the texture actives are in here too. Texture. Uh, here's a texture active with all of its parameters. There's the examples. Here's some how to use the thing. Here's what all the parameters mean. There's the methods for it, not too many methods, some static methods, though, make logo and make backing, some properties, and then there's the texture actives, plural. So I've just expanded open the texture actives, plural. There's its parameters, a description, the examples, uh, an example, uh, the param what, what the parameters do. We have the, uh, the methods, add, remove, add mesh, uh, properties, that are available and various events on it. And then when you make a texture actives, the plural one, you might have more than one texture actives thing. Okay, so texture actives control a bunch of um, texture active objects. But then if you have an ortho orthographic uh, camera and scene, you'll have different texture actives than you would if you have a perspective camera and scene. So we realized, oh gosh, we've got to make a manager. So the manager is made automatically for you. You don't have to think about it. And if you dispose all the texture actives, then the manager will get disposed. So you don't need to worry about it. But there's a few things, I suppose. This is going to handle all of your tiling uh, going across, just in case you have multiple managers. And this is also where you'll get the events uh, to, well, or the methods to toggle those if you want. So remember when I said we, we didn't press on the logo to make it toggle that, we had to hit the T key. So the method will be on the manager property of the texture actives. So that's how you would toggle. And also this is where you can change your key. So your toggle key can be changed uh, here as well. All right, so um, that's the docs for those guys in amongst the Zim docs. Which, remember, is up at the, well, up the top here. Okay, Zim docs right here, zimjs.com, and then hit the docs like so. All righty, um, closing down that then, here's our, what we're, we're coding. So let's go back into the code. Hopefully you guys are doing okay in this fun explore. Oh, and remember if this ever gets too lengthy for you, I think this will be kind of a short one, but if this ever does get too lengthy, you're welcome to pop out and get a cookie or some licorice or hot chocolate, something like that. So that's what we're doing with the three JS. And it gives us the scene, the camera and the renderer. Uh, and also, when we bring in three, we get a G GLTF loader, which is good. Oh, I was going to say that that old phone model we just converted through Blender, I guess, to a GLTF, and it works just fine. Yay! So, uh, I remember like the dawn of three three D, and we we were doing paper vision and flash and stuff. And it's just like every single time we tried to load a model, it wouldn't work. And there's all oh, model this problem, model that problem, what format problem, problem, problem. GLTF seems to be on the verge of really easy. Yay. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's not your experience. I, I don't really work in 3D a lot. So I suppose if I did, I'd probably get better at it. But um, anyway. Probably is your experience, <laughs> be my guess, or at least historically, is. So let's uh, begin here then with the Zim stuff. There's us bringing in Zim three as mentioned, and now we can. Now we're inside a Zim, so we're doing a fit mode. 
this, these dimensions here actually don't really matter too much because we're, as we build the objects in Zim, we're taking that object and we're caching it and using the cache canvas, it's called, or the canvas property of it to uh, show on the texture. So where it is in the Zim frame or how big it is, it doesn't actually really matter too much. But anyway, this happens to be the default settings here. A, we've got some blue. By setting a background color blue, we actually, without doing anything, we get that blue. Back. That's the Zim blue color. Sort of that teal coise, I call it. Teal coise, do you like that? And, but if you put in a skybox or something like that, then that would be uh, fine as well. Many, I think all of the other examples have skyboxes, and so be it. We call the ready function when we're ready, and then we're also bringing in, do we even need a font? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that was just left over. Oh, we do need a doctor abstract PNG, and we do need a font, right? Because when we first load this thing, this font is the same as Impact. Impact works fine on, on PCs and it's like built in, so you just say font impact. But if you're on a Mac, it doesn't really work. So that means this is the Google font that is much like Impact, I guess. And there we are loading in uh, that as an asset. Do you see that? So if we have multiple assets, we put them in an array and it comes right after the ready event. So there's the Dr. Abstract PNG, and uh, that PNG is coming from the Assets folder. It ignores, because we put a URL on that, it ignores. Uh, it assumes, obviously, we want that from the full URL there. But in the Assets folder, since we're here, may as well take a look. There's the Assets folder, and in the Assets folder is Dr. Abstract. Bum, bum, bum. That is, a, can you tell? <laughs> that is an AI version of Dr. Abstract. So I did a, a bunch of those, they're quite fun. So that's us in Zim loading in any images or sounds. That's also how you can uh, load in sounds as well, preload them. And then when all those are ready, we, it calls the ready event. We're given the frame, the stage, the stage width. Uh, I've told you in a few of the other other uh, bubblings and explorers. If you want to find out about Zim, then come to the Learn section, and there's a good video series right here called Zim Basics. Assuming you already know JavaScript, Zim Basics would be the one to go to next. It's our, one of our latest series, so it has fairly, you know, like just a one or two versions of Zim ago, whereas uh, Creative coding is, is great for learning JavaScript. So if you don't know JavaScript, you might want to come and take a look at that. But that was um, back a few versions of Zim ago. It's still not too bad, but there you go. And here's the Explorer series. Wow, what do you know? If you want to get a sense, like if you haven't used Zim before and you're seeing these videos because, oh, you know, I wanted to put some components into 3JS and I heard about Zim, then you might want to peek at the Zim Code in 5 Minute series. It's a whole bunch of, well, obviously close to 5 minute videos where we make something in 5 minutes and I think you'll be amazed at how quickly and how many different things that we can make in Zim. If you've at all come from the Flash background, uh, you might want to check, check out the Zim tutorials for Adobe Animate. Um, there you go. Anyway, uh, creative coding on CodePen, uh, stuff for kids. If you're a kid, hey, even if you think like a kid, might want to check this out. And there's Zim School, and I also teach a postgrad at Sheridan, which is renowned for its animation. Yay! So, um, yeah, come and, come and join us. I think we have room this year in September. You're welcome to join us at Sheridan, especially if you're in Canada, but uh, even international students are welcome. We have many of those. And we've got various articles. So if you like more like a book approach, then there's this, Your Guide to Creative Coding on the Canvas. I think you'd really like that. Okay, and more and more and more. All righty, well, let's head back into the code though. <laughs> hey, we got in the first line, all right. So uh, the, uh, the reason why I did that is the purpose of these videos, this, these explorers aren't really to teach you how to use Zim. Hopefully it'll be simple enough that you just understand it from even just seeing it. So we'll have to move along a little bit. If you're wanting to use the texture actives, I would sug highly suggest reading every single one of these lines. It will just help you understand what's going on and make it easier for you in the end and easier for us. Although we're always welcome to help, we're at zimjs.com slash slack and zimjs.com slash discord. 
Okay, so we're into Zim now. We're making a puzzle that is a new texture active. So there you go. This is very. Uh, this is extends a Zim page, which extends a container. It's basically it just holds stuff. That's what it does. And we're setting a width and height on that. Mm, what was this part for? This is oh, this is happens just to be the shape of the puzzle. We're trying to. It's going to be a bit higher, I think, than needed in the end. And we fiddled around with these numbers until we got the proportion that we wanted. It's faint. Let's change that to um, green. Okay, if I set it to green and we run this again like that, you'll see that uh, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> um, tiki. Oh, this is the live version. Okay, so that's the live version. We want to run our local version. Open in default browser. Yes, that's what I was expecting. So we have some orange stuff, and the orange stuff is on in the texture actor as a rectangle. So you're going to see that in just a minute. Here is the the full of the texture active right here, and note that it goes down below, and this is the model that's actually peeking up through there. You can't quite tell, but that's 3D. So the model is this round button, and we're so close to the edge of the. Um, of the phone there. The, oh, can you see that? Anyway, so that's just poking up through there. So that's the full texture active. We just set it to what color? Clear, I guess. Oh, faint. So the clear color is the same as an alpha of zero. So it's like no color at all. And it's not interactive. So if we set this to be invisible, basically, then watch what happens. We refresh here. There it is. But note that I can orbit zoom out here, or sorry, orbit controls. I made an app called Orbit Zoom a long time ago. I used it for ages. So if I say orbit zoom, I mean orbit control. Okay. But anyway, if we we can orbit control out here, but we can't orbit control on on this because it's it's clear. It's a zero and it's not interactive. We do have a way on the canvas to do this expand. It sets this thing called a hit area and that's uh, invisible but hittable. But anyway, we don't need to do that. We can just set it to faint and nobody's going to notice. That's uh, interactive. Uh, the other way that we can deal with that is the texture active has a parameter. <laughs> the texture active has a parameter. I don't need that one anymore in the docs called docs called texture. Did I spell that right? No. Mm, backing orbit right there. Backing orbit. So you can either set the backing orbit to true or false. And basically what that's saying is use orbit controls on the backing. So the backing will automatically have orbit controls. We found that that was just more natural. The things in the panel will not have orbit controls because they're interactive. We don't want to hit them. I mean, it's, it's very obvious when it comes to the first example here. So let's press on that. So here's the first example. We don't want orbit controls when we're dragging the circle or pressing this or using the slider. But we probably do want orbit controls when we just press on the panel. Okay, but if you don't want orbit controls when you press on the panel or, or the texture, then you can set the, oh, what was it, <laughs> backing orbit. <laughs> of course, you can set the backing orbit to false. And then when you drag here, it, it won't move the panel. Like when you drag this thing, it won't move the panel at all. Just stay stationary. All right, anyway, back, back to our current one. So like this, that's staying stationary even though we're dragging the panel. But as soon as we go to not faints, plural, but uh, faint, <laughs> we can see that we can drag the panel like so. For that to happen though, these letters would also have to not receive the mouse so that the mouse goes through to the backing. And this orange rectangle would not be, we wouldn't want to receive the mouse with that orange rectangle either. So both of those will have to turn the mouse off for them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to press through it. So I think you'll see down below here, here's a rectangle that we're making that is almost the puzzle height, but we minus some mount. So remember that the, the puzzle height's going from here down to just under the button. Our rectangle is 95 pixels less than that. That's just some trial and error. But we add it to the puzzle, 
So we add it to the puzzle and then we say no mouse. No mouse is short for two interactive properties. One is called mouse enabled equals false. So that will set the object mouse enabled false. The problem is, is if it has if it has children, then those are not set to false because we have another property that is mouse uh, children. Children equals false. And both of those would have had to have been put on the rectangle, so we would have had to put this in a const. Const rect is equal to, and we would have said in both cases, rect dot. All right, that's very common. It goes back to flash. It goes back to director before that. I've been doing this since the mid 90s. And that's a very that that's how we sort of decided that we would make things either pay attention to the mouse or not. I think in HTML there's some sort of pointer events false or something like that is is one of the settings. But I don't know if they have the children pointer events issue. There might be a way to deal with that. There should be, but. Anyway, uh, we're talking interactive media, and we've been doing it for years, so we know what we're talking about. HTML is a little bit new at the <laughs> at that. <laughs> okay, it's just a different culture. Um, but anyway, uh, those two things are kind of tricky and hard to remember to do them both, and you know, for especially for beginners. So we've wrapped them in a no mouse, and then if you want to turn it back on, you just say mouse. By default, mouse is on, but. Uh, that's the way we have done it in Zim to make it a bit easier for people. Okay, Whoop. explore. I should turn this up every time I say explore. Explore. There we go. Anyway, was that fun? Did you at least chuckle? If you didn't chuckle, that's it. You're totally serious. Yeah, you're like a coder. Let's get this done. Let's get on with it. I, I thought you said it was going to be a short one. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so there's a rectangle. It's no mouse, it's added to the puzzle, great. And now we're going to use this, um, what's it called, a static method on, right on the class, texture active, uh, make logo. That gives us the texture active logo. You probably won't need it, but you're always welcome to uh, use it if you wanna throw it on the back of a panel. Do you remember how we, how we did it on this one? Oh, Zoom Canvas window. So that that is another one that's on there called Make Backing, I think, or something. So Texture Active Make Backing will make this nice Canvas window backing for you. <laughs> you like that? I like how it's uh, see through. Um, I never did get to show show you how double sided works. And yeah, let's can can we do that? Let me just show you how double sided works. It's really cool to see this interactive and uh, <laughs> it's twice now i believe if you listen to the other videos twice now we mentioned it and then forgot to show you so uh, because this is a shorter one potentially why don't we go explore that yeah it's back oh, the main interactive one i think we even put a uh, i think we put a comment in there and to say double-sided works down in here it's <laughs> gone. No, we didn't say that in the in the raw version of this, right? Because we abstracted it and just said make three dot make panel, which means I don't know. I can't remember if there's a way to turn it um, uh, the texture on that. No, I don't think so. I think this is hey, if you're gonna want to make a basic panel, no fancy stuff, then go ahead. There's a bit of fancy stuff there, but not enough. So we'll have to go to the raw version of that. And if we scroll down to the raw version, menu, here it is. Look, need to comment out the, okay, so there's a few things we have to do, but not much. And, and we're sort of jumping ahead because we haven't seen how we integrate this. Uh, but uh, let's see, what do we want to do? First of all, why don't we bring it back? And it says, works, need to comment out the canvas window backing. Right, because the window backing is going to be in the way. So here's the back of it. And if we want to see back through it, then we get, get rid of the backing. That should be good, except will I have to do anything with that backing texture? It's not on the ignore list. No, it's OK. So uh, that should be good. I don't. I passed in the backing, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. We've turned the double-sided on, and are you ready? This is just a demonstration anyway. We, we're not really looking at the code. Here it is. So there it is, like so. 
and I can pick that up and move it around. Are you ready? Oh my gosh, here it is reversed. <laughs> and I can still operate it. Isn't that hilarious? So I think that's amazing. I don't even know how, where to begin to describe that. Uh, the slider still goes the right way. It's like, <laughs> isn't that cool? So, uh, yeah, hopefully that was worth the explore right there. And it's like, oh my God, interactive material on both sides. That's phenomenal. Wow. Okay, and uh, now we better close that down and undo this. Save it up and not do anything with it. Okay, we close that one down and we're back into the code here. Good. So, where did we get to? <laughs> Fourth line. Yay. That's the Texture Active Make logo. And we've chosen the dark version of the logo there. Okay. There's a light version of the logo and a dark version of the logo. And we can also choose to make that logo interactive. Remember we talked about wanting to click it and make it run the method. So let's do that together. Uh, comma true. By default, it's not true. So I'm not, I'm not going to change. This is the old one. It's not true so that we can press through it and still operate the orbit controls. Okay, if, if it's not a link. Later on, we realized, oh, it'd be handy to kind of make that a link, in which case um, we are turning it true. I don't, I don't know. Until we thought until we realized, oh, it'd be good to make that a link to, you know, whatever, I can't remember, oh, to toggle the, uh, the Tiki, we thought nobody would ever press on that Texture Active logo. So we, we turned it mouse enabled and, and, and mouse, uh, mouse enabled false and mouse children false by default. Okay, so that it didn't get in the way of, of that action. And now that we are constantly pressing through, <laughs> we might not want to make that the default. But anyway, let's turn the, the, uh, the true on, or we might not want to make false the default. So put the true on so that it's mouse enabled. And we're going to add, right now we're scaling it to the puzzle 80%. Isn't that nice? We like the scale too. It's nice. So there's the puzzle is the orange part. Well, it's a little bit bigger than the orange part. But we're scaling it 80% of the width there and we're positioning it at zero from the center. So this is the horizontal from the center and 20 from the top on the puzzle. Don't forget to put it in the puzzle. If you don't put it on the puzzle, it's Gandhi because we're, we're only using what's in the puzzle as the texture. Okay, we're caching that. Only what's in there is the texture. We, we I have no idea where that logo went. It's not even showing here because we haven't brought it in. So anyway, that's why you have to remember. Put it on the puzzle and remember that the puzzle is the texture active that we're putting that in. All right, what else do we want to do? We want to dot tap on that, dot tap. And by the time I'm starting to go off the screen, arrow function, like so by the time I get way over here, I kind of say, oh, well, you know, maybe we should do one of these moves. And so we're uh, dropping, I call that dropping down, like so, just like we've done with a few other things here. And then in the tap, we will say, uh, by the time we tap it, we'll have this other thing made, the texture active object, or texture actives plural object right here. So based on the texture actives, we want to turn, uh, toggle those. Do you remember what the toggling is? It's going to go like this, hit the T key. Oh, there's, there's the texture active. It's on the stage in the middle. Yay! Okay, that's where the heck it went. Because we didn't add it to the texture actives here, it just automatically got added to the stage by default. And there it is, somewhat down and zero from the center. Okay, um, that's the texture active that supposedly looks better on dark. See what I mean? So it's up to you. There's also a light version. The light version is here. It's a light version which looks better on light. Uh, anyway, the T key is what toggles that. We're wanting to toggle it when we press on the logo. That's what we're doing right now. And did we put that back in the puzzle? We did, okay. So when we tap on it, we want to go to the texture actives, plural, manager. Oh, uh, 
No, we don't know what that is. Texture actives dot manager. Okay. So there is a manager property of texture actives that will point through to that, that all encompassing manager of texture actives because there might be more than one. All right. And that single manager, we are going to say dot uh, either show or dot toggle. I think we can say true like that. Um, but when we tap it again, yeah, talk, just toggle like that. So when we tap it again, it will toggle. Um, that's the nice thing about toggle is if it's already showing, it will unshow it. And if it's not showing, then it will go the other way around. So that's it. A dot tap on that. You may not, you, you would probably wouldn't have seen a dot tap before. We're also able to do this, something like const ta, we'll call it, is equal to. And don't do a tap, but rather do uh, ta dot add event listener. Okay, you've done those before. Or in Zim, we have on. So on mouse down or click. Then we go call that arrow function that we already made before. Okay. Yeah, let's quickly bracket. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so if that's freaking you out that we had a tap and you haven't, you don't know what that is, this is, there's our object, texture active object, and we can say texture active object dot on mouse down, go here. Okay, or that could have been a click or a mouse move or, whatever, or a press move or uh, other things. Okay, um, but anyway, that doesn't chain. So the on method is not chainable because it returns uh, uh, an ID so that we can turn the event off with the off method. All right, you can only chain, this is called chaining, you can only chain things that return the object that it's on. So we didn't like having to, you note that we didn't even store that in a variable. We, we didn't even have to keep track of it. It was all, all done for us. It was as much as we wanted. But anyway, so now we can get rid of that, chain on a tap, like this, dot tap, and that's the thing inside the tap. Okay, got it? So position it dot tap. That's just, that's like a click. And then this is what's um, inside that. All right, and it should toggle. You ready? Let's try it. Bum, bum, bum. Good, that's back again. Note that it's now interactive. And when we tap it, it does the toggle. And when we tap it again, it does the toggle. Maybe we didn't add the toggle because you know, it's like, whoopee, <laughs> there's only one thing to look at. So the toggle's not quite as exciting. Uh, in some of the other ones, it's very exciting to see all of the textures laid out for you. Not only is it exciting, it's very useful because that allows you to quickly look at all of your interactive textures, try them out right there rather than having to go out and find them in the 3D world. So it's an amazing productivity tool. I haven't seen much like that, um, and so uh, I think that's really exciting, and I'm glad that we did that for you guys as you're, as you're building. Oops. <laughs> Oops. So this one's a little more exciting. Do you want to see what that one looks like toggled? If I hit the T key, this is the one menu, and then when I slide this thing over, there's the backing texture active. Here's the first texture active. I can tell you want to see more. Let's, let's look at all of them. Yeah. So here's number four, which is a HUD. So this one's got a bunch of stuff on it and we're gonna do an explore through the HUD. But if you hit the T key here, here are all of those things. And you can also swipe like that. So there I am swiping through all of the live sliders. If I move that slider up to the, the maximum and close this or hit the T key again, the slider is up to the maximum. If I turn it right down to a minimum and hit the T key or hit that logo, the slider is at the minimum. So this is this is live stuff. Isn't that cool? Uh, the, these actually play notes. If we turned on the sound. Can you hear that? <laughs> cool, huh? And those are doing something. I'm not sure what. I think this one. Anyway, uh, oh, that one does the speed of things. <laughs> and this one. Oh, that one does the speed and this one does the bumpiness. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, right. Do you, do you want to just hit that? Uh, where was it? Buzzy. Look, there it says Buzzy. Cosmic. Organ. Okay.
Isn't that cool? So I think that's really cool. Let's close that down though, and we're back into uh, our code again. Open in default browser. And remember, if I ever go on too long, you're always welcome to put it on pause and go grab that cookie. So now we have that toggling. See, toggles back and forth, toggle. Or we can hit the TT still. Like I said, you, you probably won't do that. It's, it's mostly for demonstration anyway. Uh, I don't think that you're going to be demonstrating texture actives and probably never will use that logo. And as a matter of fact, you probably don't want the toggle on because then people could cheat at your, in your world or in your game. But as you're developing, then you might want, well, not necessarily the logo, but the toggle and that system. Once you're done, it's, it's really easy to, to deal with. One, first of all, when you do your texture actives object down here, you can specify the T key. So where's the texture actives? Here's the texture actives plural object. One of the parameters in here is which key activates that. And if you just set it to minus one, then it doesn't get activated. Okay, and so that'll be up to you. We considered making it not active to start because it's kind of dangerous. If you had no idea about that, it's kind of dangerous to leave it around. All of a sudden, somebody finds a T key and they go, oh my goodness, what's all this? <laughs> I just got taken out of my world and now I can do all these interfaces. <laughs> I'm like on a God mode or something. But anyway, uh, we've, we've left it in and you have to turn it off if you want it off. Good. Here is a button, and so this is a button that has a width and a height there and a corner uh, that makes it round, basically. It's alpha is zero, so why don't we... Oh, and we've done the expand. So in that time, note we set the alpha to zero. We set it expand to zero. And that means it'll still be clickable even though the alpha is zero. Otherwise, we could have set the alpha to 0 0.01 and not bothered with the expand. But when it comes to buttons, usually I would expand. And as a matter of fact, quite often I'll expand and just leave this as is. So an expand like that will automatically expand. The reason why we made expand is it adds a padding around it. So it's easier on mobile. So that will automatically add 20 pixels around it. But I felt that in this example where we're trying to show you that we have a texture act, that button's first of all, fairly big. I didn't want the finger to appear 20 pixels away. We're trying to show you how accurate this is. Watch. Isn't that cool? Like that is, that's quite accurate. So we, we didn't want it 20 pixels outside and you kind of going, oh, that's, that's not very accurate, <laughs> et cetera. So we did the expand, but we expanded with zero on that. Uh, shall we see it though? Let's change it to an alpha of one or not include the alpha. And here's what that button looks like. It lo <laughs> looks like it's off center, but it's not. It's, it's really not off center. That's the model is the issue. This little dark ring around it is where the dark circle is. And it just happens to be that the model, uh, the sem hemisphere or whatever is on here isn't quite <laughs> isn't quite centered on there. I swear it's the model. It's not us. Um, okay, so that's where the button is. And we are doing what with that? We want to set that back to zero. We're centering it on the puzzle. Then we're positioning it. Why did we bother doing that? We don't need to center it on the puzzle. We just want to position it. It must have been just playing around with some stuff and poofing around. So when we tap it, hey, we already saw the tap. Nice, huh? When we tap it, if the message, if message.parent, what does that mean? Uh, if the message.parent, what's the message? Okay, down below here, we must have a message. No, I don't think I see a message anywhere. Message, let's do a search for it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. I found it, it's right there there. So message is a container with a puzzle. Add to puzzle. All right. New container, puzzle with puzzle height, add to puzzle. What are we doing with the message? 
group the text and arrow in a container so we can animate them in and out together. All right, okay, so let's refresh here. I think what's happening is when we, we didn't animate them in, or I couldn't tell because the whole thing's animating, but what we're getting at is when we change over to the puzzle, whoop, like that, we crossfade. So we're animating out the message and animating in this. Uh, the message is made up of this label right there, or label letters it is, because uh, you can see that each letter is moving, and an arrow. An arrow is something sec sec secondary. If we didn't group them, then we would have had to animate this one and that one, which is no problem, but uh, it's probably better to group them. It just sort of makes sense. So that's what message is. It's a container preparing us for that. Are we ready to look at it? Oh yeah, we were sort of in the tap. So the tap is doing some things that we haven't seen yet, like dealing with the scrambler, dealing with the message. So why don't we come back to what happens when we tap and we'll just check out this message right now. We are doing label letters. So normally you would make a Zim label and that would have the text in it. But if you want to animate each letter individually or apply sort of HTML like formatting to like things like uh, bolds and colors and underlines and make certain parts of them parts of the text interactive we have label letters so you can do things like that so there's what we're putting in label letters we're centering it on the message we're moving it up or down sorry a little bit or which which, which is, sorry half in 3js half in zim in zim positive y is down okay so that's that's how it usually is with two dimensionals so in two dimensionals, top left corner is zero, zero, just like we're reading. So we read positive this way and positive down. In 3JS, I think it's uh, some things switch up. X and Y is still the same. No, X is still the same. Y is positive going up, which, you know, also makes sense. <laughs> uh, since 3JS is more like the real world, I guess, <laughs> we usually think of positive as being up. And then positive Z is coming out, out at you. Uh, but in the 2D world, you have to remember that, uh, where were we looking there? This is the Y value. So, oops, that's just moving it down a little bit. That's all. We're just moving the label letters down a bit from center so that we have room for the logo up there. All right, and no mouse so that we can interact with the backing. Hey, remember how to do that? Yeah, and remember we did that on the rectangle up here. See the rectangle anywhere? Here it is. No mouse so we can interact through it. Okay, and then we're, we've got these written, but we applied some style as well. It's just a little bit easier. Some of these, uh, we've got some options. It's called the Zim Duo technique where we can do parameters in order. This is the start of doing parameters in order. I can't remember what the next parameter for label is. Maybe it's, it's font or it's color or it's size, probably it's size. So we could put the size of 80 in there. We look at the parameters and do that. But there's some alignment that stuff is going on later. If we wanted to, we could have taken this whole thing right here and probably just put it right in there like that and said text is, oh, whatever the text was going to be, press four, blah, blah, blah. All right, so that, that would also work. That's just, that's the Zimduo technique where we're putting a configuration object in there. You've seen a few configuration objects happening already on the button, on the uh, texture active here. But we, we don't have to do that. We could have just put in the width and the height or whatever the parameters are without the squiggly brackets. So that's the Zimduo technique, sort of unique to Zim. And unfortunately, well, fortunately for, uh, we, we just found out that, um, it's not unique everywhere because Python does it. It's like, oh, <laughs> we thought we invented it 10 years ago, but uh, so be it, whatever. That's, that's good, I'm glad they do that. I wonder if they did it after us. Wouldn't that be funny? Hmm, we should look into that. Do you think Python's had that right from the beginning? Anyway, whatever. So that would be possible, or I think what happened is I just put in, uh, this thing and then realized, oh, I want to get to some other parameter. And I just threw a style up here. Style would apply right across all, uh, well, until we turn off the style. So that would apply to any anything that has these properties. If we wanted to target specifically label letter things, 
Oh, you know what it is? Ah, that's right. Okay, label letters does not have all of these parameters, but some of these parameters, whatever they are, I can't remember which ones it is, some of those parameters will flow through to the uh, actual label inside of label letters. So label letters turns each of these into a label. So we wanted a, a property on one of those labels. Oh, for crying out loud. Uh, I'm still not quite used to VS Code. Now it handles its um, highlighting, like it, it's dragging that for me. Anyway, whatever. Um, so where was I before I started complaining? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we want one of these things goes a little bit deeper that label letters doesn't have like one of these properties and I can't remember what it is. Maybe it's the font. Yeah, so we can't just take all of these and put them right on label letters because it doesn't have all those parameters. So the style, though, will will flow through. That's what, that's why we did it. Nuances, huh? But it is great that Zim has style. I don't think any other Canvas framework has style, very much like CSS, because we were already doing the nice, easy Zim Duo technique, and we realized, oh, if we just pull those things up and put them in general, then we can do it. I was going to say, if we wanted them only for the label letters, we can uh, say, hey, these styles are only for the label letters, and put that in there. I wonder if this would tell us which one's missing. Try that again. There we go. So only for the label letters. Yeah, let's see what happens. Explore. I could be telling. I am telling the truth. Do you see that? So what was it? Font size? Looks like the size of 80 is not a label letters parameter. Let's have a look. So there's the docs, label. There's label on arc. Label letters. Okay, so label is up here too. Label, label on path, label on arc, label letters. What were we looking for? Size? Yeah, it's like a pain in the neck. When we're making this, you can imagine. Here we are making label letters. Well, you know, then we would have to, if we really wanted all of them, we'd have to take all of the parameters of the label. All of the parameters of the label, <laughs> right? And stick them into label letters somewhere plus all of the parameters of label letters so instead of doing instead of bringing in all of these we say all right you can pass in a string there just a string and we'll make a default label for you you can fix these things but otherwise you get a default label or you can pass in a label object there so if we wanted to we could have passed in a label object there with the parameters like size that we wanted but rather than do any of that we just threw a string there and use style to uh, flow on through. Okay, but anyway, that, that would be how we'd apply style directly to the label letters. There's also applying styles to a group, which is like a class in CSS. We didn't use the word class because we've got classes in JavaScript, but you can say, hey, this is group big and put some styles in for group big and then apply group big to any of the, that's what this thing is at the back here. Group style and group, you can, say don't use style you can say what group it is or a set of groups you can deal with inheritance as well and even though this looks like it's way at the end it's at the end for every single one of them remember that we've got the zim duo so we can easily avoid having to go undefined 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 <laughs> or whatever and then <laughs> and the style or the, the group okay in other words we can just go group oh well not there down River. Somewhere, 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 wherever. This doesn't have a, a Zim Duo yet. Uh, here's a Zim Duo. Comma, group, colon, big, something like that. That would be like a class. Be a member of the class. Okay, so we want to go back to the style and everything. And there's also a style, like this is the sort of style literal, I guess you would call it, like that. There's also a style class. 
that has other things. So you could say style.clear right after and it would clear it. There's remembering styles. There's You can apply add styles and deal with styles. So right on that, that's a sort of more conventional way, but I usually use the just the literal. And then to clear the style so it doesn't continue, we just say that as opposed to style.clear, which would have been the same if we put it there. Put it there. All right. <laughs> you good? Hopefully you're good. All right, where'd we get to then? There's the text. Oh, we're going to wiggle them. So we're going to take that text, which is called label letters. We're looping through the letters. Uh, well, looping through all the letters and getting the letter. And then we're setting the shadow of the letter. And we're wiggling that uh, uh, about its rotation, about zero, a minimum of five and a maximum of 10. So here's the wiggle stuff. What property are we wiggling? What's the start value, which is zero? Um, what's the minimum and maximum we want to wiggle? And what's the min time and the max time that we want to wiggle? There's other parameters here too, but those are the ones you would usually use. And what do we get, ladies and gentlemen? We get, boop, boop, boom. What do we get when we save it? Ladies and gentlemen, what do we get when we save it? There they are. Uh, see that nice drop shadow on there? And there's some wiggling, wiggling letters. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. On, uh, on a texture. Amazing. Okay, so what's next? We also have a way to type into a texture or type into here, and that works as well. So we've got a thing called, um, what's it called? Label input, input, tech, no, tech, label input, no, text input, text input. It's called text input, and what it does is it displays text as an image, but hides an HTML text field off the screen. But because it's displaying it all as an image and not just an overlay, then it actually works on here. And it's like, oh, thank goodness it works. And wow, that is so cool. So you can just start typing some text right in here on this text on this. Um, I should show that actually. Well, I won't show it now, but I mean, we should make, uh, Zim should make an example with that on there. Cause I'm not sure if there's, if you guys know how to do that otherwise. And that was a very tricky class to make. It's almost like asking someone, oh, remake a text field. And it's like, that's harder than you think. <laughs> a lot harder than you think. A lot, a lot, a lot harder. Think, think that it might be hard and think like, I don't know, a hundred times harder than what you think it might be. Uh, that's why the canvas doesn't have a text input <laughs> because it's a hundred times harder than you think. Uh, anyway, on we go here. And we turned off the style. We probably could have turned off the style somewhere else, like up above. Just threw that in there. Good. And we have the arrow. So the arrow is similar. We've got an arrow. That's the type of arrow. We're jumping right to the type because otherwise it might have been, I don't know, size and color or something first. I'm not sure. But see how handy the Zim Duo technique is? We just plopped it right in there like that. Uh, I mentioned that Python does that. You're welcome to confirm. Python does it this way, which is very nice too. That's actually nicer. Type is equal to. But remember, that's how you actually do default Java. You're, you're looking at that going, yeah, JavaScript can do that. No, it can't. This is us making a new arrow. We're not collecting the parameter as a default there in ES6. Uh, we'd be passing in thick as um, the value for that and jumping directly to the type parameter. And so JavaScript can't do that, but we can. And we open source that. So this is open source on GitHub. Uh, not too many people, <laughs> not too many people using that, but uh, why don't we have a look? Okay, so here's Zim, and there's gold, and down below. So the gold brings us down to the gold bars of Zim. You see that? So there's Zim, gold bars, the gold bars of Zim, and then it's this one right here, uh, which is our GitHub. And then if you hit the Dan Zen right there, that's my old name, Dan Zen. There's Duo, it's called, right there. There's also Pick, which is dynamic parameters. These two we use in Zim. They're so, I think, important that we've open sourced them. We open source, but look at our star number. No stars. <laughs> two stars, all right. Here's Zimon, uh, which is, turns any object into a string. 
Dum dum dum. So that's beyond JSON. It's doing like what JSON can do for for object literals, arrays. Uh, does he, JSON even work with Boolean? Maybe ish. <laughs> and numbers and strings, obviously. But any object, so imagine that, like even a particle emitter and et cetera, can be turned into, it's really the command itself that gets turned into a string. And then when it, it gets received, that command is rerun. So it will only work if your platform has that command, but it, it's cool. You can store objects in a database and bring them back and they'll run in Zim. Okay, so that's cool. Whereas JSON is sort of more, it works across different languages because those, uh, what it's storing is, are com they're common for those languages. Anyway, check out Duo. It's a few, uh, it's a couple lines of code, maybe 30 lines of very, tw well, 10, 20 lines of very complicated code. You want to see it? Oh, I can't remember what it looks like even. Where is it? Duo.js. That is an example, is duo, this is the example. Okay, so that's not the actual code. <laughs> okay, so where, where is the code in here? I don't know, read me in duo JS script was an example. Anyway, you got an example and presumably the actual code to do the duos in there somewhere too. Okay. Explore. So you'll have to just go explore and look for that. I'm sure it logically tells you where it is. Alrighty. Scrambler. Arrow. Scrambler. We're almost at the scrambler. How exciting. Yeah, we may as well look at the scrambler. Then we'll come back and take a look at the clicking of the button. Because the button brings in the message and the scrambler. So let's see the scrambler. A new scrambler, we chop up a new pick of Dr. Abstract. So I think the scrambler now works with, or the chop works with just the pick. Let's, should, should we give it a go? Let's see. <laughs> nope, now this means an error, F12. Failed to execute create image data on blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we didn't simplify it that much. Uh, sometimes we do, um, we have made a new picture or a new pic of that stuff that we brought in. Dr. Abstract from the assets folder. This preloads it. If we say new pic, it will make an object for us. We are going to chop up that object into a three by three, or we could chop it up into a three by 10. Let's see what that looks like. And then we pass that, this makes what's called a zim tile, and we pass the tile into the scrambler. And that makes a puzzle for us. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, cute little guys. That's a harder puzzle, isn't it? Actually, that's quite a challenging puzzle. I like it though. I got the neck right, okay. One thing you run into a bit of an issue there is both those colors are the same. So there is a way to handle that, that either of them could be right, but you'd have to actually uh, manually put in a list of the order in a sense. And then that can handle uh, pieces that are the same and it doesn't matter which side they go on. But anyway, that's chopped up too much for the picture because, because of that, but easy enough to fix that kind of thing. And now let's check out the performance, 10 by 10 somewhat check out the performance. Looks nice. Okay, what are you saying? A little bit of a drop shadow on that. Phenomenal. To me, that is absolutely phenomenal that this is working like that. Ray casting. So that's the ray casting into CreateJS, the raw CreateJS, which replaces the mouse, the mouse um, pointers, and then that bubbles up into Zim or just like works up into Zim. I mean, it was uh, quite tricky to arrange that, but uh, that's that's really cool. Alrighty, so uh, that's 
the scrambler there. We're scaling it to the puzzle, 100% in the width. That means it will fit in the width there. There's also another parameter there to scale it based on the Y or whichever is the smaller. There's also a stretching and a fitting and a filling uh, parameter after that on the scale too. Do not chain the on method. So we want to complete. There's no chainable complete thing. There's only a chainable tap and a chainable change. Change and tap we use all the time on components. So we made those chainable instead of methods. There's also another form of methods called wire. So wire and wired. Uh, you can wire things to each other. I don't know if you can wire a complete. Maybe you can, but um, it's more like if you if you don't want to do a change event, you would wire it, and and it's just kind of like in one line connects up these things. So as I move this, something else changes. Anyway, when it's complete, we're going to animate. Here's us using the Zim animate function. We usually animate right on an object. So for instance, when we animated, did we animate something? Tell me if you see an animate. There's message.animate, alpha to zero. So we're going to come back and look at that animation in just a second, and then we animated. So animate is nice and easy in Zim. We just chain it right on to the, the object that we want to animate. But uh, that works when it gets on to Zim objects. We here are animating the phone, and the phone is not a Zim object, so we use the animate function, and we say that the target is whatever. That means it could be a, a CSS property, it could, if it's a CSS property, we turn CSS true. But this is not a CSS property either. This is kind of like some other object that has a rotation property like that. Note, right, we have dot syntax. Normally, we don't have two things like that. It would just be the rotation. But uh, 3JS throws all of its properties on yet another property. So this is a... Um, called the dot syntax animation thing where we put it into quotes there. And then we're rotating that three times around. Radians is a Zim constant that turns degrees into radians and deg, D-E-G, is the reverse. We're easing with the back out in a, a time of that. And when we're done, we're going to set the rotation to Y. Oh, just so the next time we, we win, see this is going 360 degrees or, or to a certain degree thing. So the next time we run it, it was already at that degree thing. So we're, we're just, after it's done, we just set it back to zero. The other way to deal with that, because that also means that if you solve the puzzle when it was at that angle, when it's finished doing its solving, it's going to be at this angle. Not a big deal. You can also do relative animation. Relative animation is with quotes, but you can't just throw that all in quotes. So it's a little bit trickier looking and would end up being something like string. and Cast all that as a string or something like that. So this is probably just easier. Great. That's animating when we're complete. And that makes... <laughs> I'm totally not going to complete this one with you right now. But if we could have completed this, you'll see that it, it spins kind of like <laughs> the drunk spin. Drunk. I don't know. Do I, hopefully I don't sound drunk. I haven't had anything to drink, I swear. I suppose I'm at perhaps a little bit bubblier than usual. I just had a last day of teaching, so it's nice to to be free. My last day of teaching, what do I do? Ah, let's come in and make a, an explorer video. That's, that's what I want to do. Well, I've also had a swim and uh, a few other things, so that's good. Alrighty, um, coming back up here then. Now that we've shown you the scrambler, and we're about to go in the three side, now that we've seen the scrambler, we've seen the arrow, which is just sort of tacked on to the bottom there. It's wiggling. Did we really look at the arrow? We didn't really look at it too much, but anyway, it's just an arrow. And the cat is wanting in behind me, which means it pulls at the screen, goes <coughs> So if you hear that, that's the cat going, let me in. All right, so we're coming up here where we've got the tap. Here's on the button. So this is this part right here. Ready? Tap. Because <laughs> I didn't save it. Save! And then tap. 
they crossfade. All right. So if the message has a parent, uh, right. Okay. So I've got the message here and it has parent because it's added to the puzzle. This is just a, sort of a toggle. If the message has, has a parent, then I'm going to animate the message to an alpha of zero in one second. I think that's the easing. So what kind of easing are you going to do? And we don't care, we'll use the default. And here is the callback. So when that animation finishes, we want to dispose the message, which will, bye bye message, we'll never see it again. And the next time we tap on that button, the message will not have a parent. It will be gone. It's like off, off the stream. Scrambler.center on the puzzle. Okay, so we're going to fade out the scrambler and we're going to fade in the puzzle. Scrambler.center on the puzzle and animate it to an alpha of one. Okay. Mm, we also moved it. Why did we move it down a bit? That's down. Oh, from the center. Yeah, so we centered the scrambler on there and then we moved it down a little bit. Remember that it actually goes down to here that we're centering it on. So this is the rectangle that we centered this scrambler on, but we found that that was up too high, so we had to move it down 10 like that. That's a relative movement. We could have treated that differently. We could have used the pose. This would have been the same thing. Dot pose, zero, comma, uh, 10, comma, from the center, in both cases, center on the puzzle. Okay, so position it zero from the center, 10 down from the center on the puzzle rather than doing this. Which one do you like better? Hard to say. Pose came along later, so I'm so used to doing the center, and often I'll just center it and then say, oh, I didn't quite get it. I think we better move it and just tag on a tack on a, a dot move. That's probably the easier way. So from a building standpoint, you center it and look at it and go, oh, nope, and then you just move it. Okay, so that's how we're leaving it there. There is also a set. Um, squiggly brackets. Oh, no, that's not going to do it. Yeah, okay, there's, there's a set as well in animate. So this is the property that it's setting. You'd have to deal with that with sort of like set and then alpha zero comma props alpha to one. Okay, so do you see that you wouldn't need the alpha of zero, then it would set this property to zero and then it would animate that property. I, I find that that's harder to remember how to do then because we've got the nice easy chaining that's a short chainable alp and if you haven't seen zim before then you might want to look at the short chainables here uh, there in the methods so we just jump down to the methods that all things have all display objects that is here's the short chainable right there Pose, loc, move, ska, alp, viz, bleh, die. That changes the color. Blend mode, hover, rotation, size, sis, ske for the skew, reg, top, bot, ord, cur, to get a cursor, sha, depth, and nom. Okay, so those are the short chainable methods that, that allow us to reduce the number of times we have to store something in a variable because we can just chain everything on it. We don't have to store it in a variable and then put properties on it. You can do that. All these have properties. So you can just set, set the alpha property or the visible property or the blend mode property or the scale X and scale Y property or the X and Y property. But you can also just keep within the chaining, uh, make everything for you. Okay. And we're going to scramble the scrambler. How, this is how long. Can't remember what that is. And although if we were using TypeScript, so if you're used to the sort of the Node world and using TypeScript and a developer and, and you're working in 3JS that way, which is fine. 3JS has gone completely that way, and that's exciting for them. We're, we 
uh, have a lot of kids as well using Zim and uh, youth and so forth that we really just don't want them to have to install Node and, and deal with all that kind of developer stuff. Uh, yarn and YAML and <laughs> whatever. So um, we, uh, I was gonna say you're welcome to use TypeScript and then you would be able to find out what these are. So you're, you're welcome to come and find Zim on GitHub or Node Package Manager and the typings are provided with that. You can do it that way. Great, anyway, we're scrambling. Yay, that's the Zim side. Wow, okay, a big sigh. I thought this was gonna be a short one. How far are we? We're one hour and 20 minutes, are you kidding me? Oh my God. All right, well, luckily, this is pretty dead easy on the 3JS side. And we've already gone through a few versions of taking a deep look at the 3JS side. So I think we'll be fine just kind of, you're probably in here going, yeah, but that's what I want to see. And you're going, no, stop it. Show me it in detail. All right. Like I said, there's actually not that much here. Yeah. Well, you know, there isn't. So let's, let's have a look. We're bringing in three using the Zim 3, but we've got a couple raw versions that show you how to do this with raw versions. For instance, here's the raw version. And if we go to the 3JS part right here, 3JS, what we're doing now is setting a, th a three dot scene. We're setting up our camera. We're setting up a render. We're uh, making sure the windows resize. That's the first part. And there's also a bottom part that you need to do to set your render right there. Okay, so you're welcome to come and look at the raw version and see how that you can do that. But since you use 3JS, you're you know, welcome to do all that. However, if you didn't want to do all that, you could do this, <laughs> which is shorter. And usually it'll get you a buy just fine. There are some more parameters in here that are helpful. And we're just storing the scene, the camera, and the render in local variables um, here. The model, we're bringing in a GLTF loader. So that comes with our import of a Zim underscore three, three JS comes there and the GLTF loader. We are going to load that phone GLTF in there and we receive the GLTF. The phone is now the scene of the GLTF, I guess. We're adding that phone to our scene and positioning that phone uh, up a little bit. We're then adding the canvas window. Okay, so this is when it loads. It takes a little while for that model to load. And down here, we've got the canvas window already being made. And it says here, we add to the model up above when the model's done loading. Because we don't know where the model is or, well, actually, we don't really need to do that. We could have added it below. We, But, oh, I know what it is. We don't want it to show up before the model gets loaded. So possibly we could have added it here and scaled it to zero or changed it. I don't know, I can't remember how to do alpha on it, but an easy way is just, hey, when the model's ready, then we'll add our canvas window on top of that. So we'll come to the canvas window in a moment. We're setting the scale to zero. So this is us using Zim Animate on the model. We're targeting the phone. So much like we spun it the last time, here we're going to animate its scale back up to one from zero to one. We're waiting 0.2 seconds and we're setting um, an ease on that in the time. Okay, so Zoom's animating the phone in. This is the HTML message that says, <laughs> Come on. I guess it's if I select this, I can't, well, I can't seem to click and say, oh, I did it that time. Why couldn't I do it before? I don't know. Anyway, um, as a teacher, I often want to select things and then select something different. It wasn't letting me unselect that. Wah! Cry baby. Anyway, uh, this is just HTML stuff. That's the message, drag anywhere at any time. If we wanted to, I suppose we could have put this in as a texture active and then removed it. But uh, I just threw some HTML on there and I'm animating it 
uh, with Zim. So here's Zim animating the HTML. So much like GreenSock or GSAP can animate a lot of things like 3JS and CSS, and it used to animate Flash. So can Zim. Zim, Zim animate uh, can do that too. We're on par. We can do as many things as, as GreenSock can or as GSAP and sometimes even more, and sometimes they do a little more. So, you know, it's, it's pretty close. We can do a lot of stuff. Animate is extremely powerful. So that's here, and easy. Animate, extremely easy. We're, we're coming in at 66% the size, or 66% less than CSS animation, for instance. Green sock, we're less than green sock, but they're more comparable, of course. So here are the various things that we are doing when we animate. And it looks like a lot of parameters, but remember we've got the Zim Duo technique, which means we can get to any one of these that we want. And there's lots of examples and lots of things. So there's sequences. You can animate in sequences. You can animate in series. You can animate along paths. You can um, drag along paths through the animate uh, system. Okay, that was all put into place in Zimneo. So if you go into the about here and then versions, version nine of Zim, which is Neo right here. This is where we introduced animation along blobs and squiggles. These are user editable. So if I go into that, uh, for instance, this drag one here, there's the path right there. I can drag along the path that's being animated, but I can also press on the path and change the path. Nobody does that. Nobody, not even Paper.js, which came from Illustrator. These are user editable paths that we're animating along. I don't know if you noticed, but as it goes up there, it gets smaller. We can also, we didn't in this case, but we can also slow it down as it gets up there. So that all that is built into the animation. Here's Parallax, where we're animating in Parallax as well. Um, anyway, uh, kind of thing, this is the extra stuff in here. I press that. So there it is. We're animating through layers, for instance. We're coming up and it slows down as it gets farther away. Again, that's a user editable path that we can do. Our paths work in this way where we can use the Beziers like so. Isn't that cool? We could miter that so it doesn't be as pointy. Okay, so yeah, lots of uh, powerful things in Zim in terms of its animation animate. Those user, user editable paths are available on textures for you. <laughs> you can do all of that on a texture, on a wall, in your 3JS. It's like, wow, I can't wait to get into virtual reality and try out that stuff. Um, we have yet to do that. So we've heard that Banter is built on uh, um, 3JS and A-Frame. So we're looking forward to moving in that direction. We've been working in alt space. So I don't know, you make, uh, we're about to do a promotional video about all this and about Dr. Abstract. That's me, my sort of dealings in virtual reality and why we're doing this and some of the vision. Uh, so it may be that you came from that video. I'm not sure we have, haven't done the video yet. <laughs> it's sort of weird, but we haven't done the video yet, but it will be there. And yes, uh, I've been in virtual reality for quite some time and really, really wanted interactive walls. And so like all these interactive NFTs that we've been doing, uh, for instance, hey, this is an explorer, isn't it? After all, this is an explorer. And once again, you're always welcome to go grab a cookie or something like that. But if we look back here under, under examples, here are interactive NFTs. I hope you don't go, NFTs, I'm shutting my eyes. Oh, let's ban NFTs. That's so what happened to Flash. So what is it, social canceling or whatever? <laughs> anyway, NFTs are wonderful. They've been making, a generative artists, programmers, generative programmers have been now making money with NFTs and rightly so for their art. We had all sorts of interactive NFTs on here and so much wanted these to be on the wall active. So here's Bloob, for instance, on Tia. Whoosh. You see this stuff? And using these controls here. Let me maximize that. So here I am using Zim controls and controlling that. And there's the curvature of it. This you can now do in 3JS on any texture, including cylinders or spheres or or whatever you want. So isn't that cool? 
Um, and we, we had pictures of these in our 3D worlds. There were pictures, but they weren't, uh, they weren't interactive. So it was all of these kind of things, even though they're interactive puzzles and interactive NFTs, <laughs> they weren't in actually interactable when it came to being inside of VR. But now they will be. Okay, there's eccentric, for instance. So you've seen the puzzle already. This was us making NFTs. 30 out of 30 got minted, and people would buy these. So here, here they all are down below. And people are reselling the NFTs, and, and like I said, they're interactive. Uh, it'd be wonderful to have these interactive inside of 3JS and indeed the, the, the virtual reality worlds made from those. So back to today's lesson, though. Bum, bum, bum. So there's Zim uh, animating that message in and out with a wait and a rewind. Isn't that nice? Hey, animate for CSS. We set it to true. The target is the note. So there's the note. The props are the opacity to 1. We wait 0.5. We rewind wait 2. And then it's going to rewind. So by default, if you rewind wait, it turns on the rewind. And when it's done, I set the display to none. Okay, although it's gone, but that'll that'll gone it even more. Otherwise, it's selectable. Um, okay, we're bringing in the orbit controls, which comes with our version of 3JS and so forth. We're making a new texture active. So here's where the texture actives happen. Texture actives, plural. We pass in the puzzle. That happens to be the only one. If it's the only one, we don't need an array. But uh, there's preparing us for an array. We pass in the three namespace, our three namespace here, or property name. If you don't use three, you just pass in null there. It all still works. The render, the scene, the camera, the controls, and one is the layer that we're going to put this uh, on. There's only one thing at the moment. However, if you had lots of things in 3JS, this is using raycasting. There's no point in raycasting all the other stuff because it doesn't need to be recast. So we're only recast raycasting layer one. By default, it would re raycast everything, but uh, if it, I think it's prudent to put a layer in there and put all of your texture active objects on that layer. Here's the puzzle, and there it is. Three dot make panel. So this is a helper method on the three object that will make a panel. We pass in the texture active. We pass in the texture actives. We say true for if we want it transparent. That's by default it is true and one, so we don't need either of these. And then 0.26 is what? The scale. Okay, so we're scaling down that panel. So this is the, if you want to turn on transparency, and this is your alpha, probably could have just put an alpha in there rather than both those. Anyway, uh, that's your scale. So we had to play with that scale, obviously, to get it the right size. So just watch that. If, if it comes in something like this, We made another boo-boo somewhere else. What have we done here? I just revert back to the very beginning. I don't think we, oh, we did put in the click link there. Anyway, whatever, I don't know if we really need that click link. I can always add it quickly again. Uh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, scale. So let's have a look at the scale. Texture actives, there's the scale. So we don't bother with a scale. Here's what we would get. Refresh. <laughs> it's the same. Oh, is uh, <laughs> it was nothing that we did wrong. Uh, it's just so big that it is covering the phone. I thought it was an error because it happened to be just kind of like sitting right up full screen. Okay, there's a little bit of the phone showing through. So it's, it's scaled too big. We want to scale that down. Although, oh, by default, that's right. It's weird, um, a little weird anyway, sorry. The scale is actually 0.5 by default. So that's your default scale. That's not the scale at all. That's the alpha. Okay, sorry, uh, one comma 0.5 is the default scale. So right there, we should probably have adjusted that so it's not um, 
whatever. But we had br brought that back to what? The scale of 0.26. So 0.26 isn't really that much smaller. It's, it's half the size of the default. And we got some lights because we've used a, a, a Fong material on that. How do we know the puzzle texture actives? We haven't used a Fong material at all. Do we even need light? Oh, we need lights because of the model. So by default, that's a mesh basic material. Sorry. Loster. Loster. Uh, by default, that's a mesh basic material. It doesn't need lights, but the phone itself needs lights. So that's why we got that in there. In some of the texture, act texture actives are fine. They work with... Um, with different materials, there's probably a parameter to pass in to find out the material in here. Maybe it's the next one. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at make panel. Under the docs, boop, make, oh, uh, panel, pa. make pa. pattern, okay. Make path, pattern. Oh, make panel is a method on the three object, okay. so. That uh, the, the search here only catches the the things that are actually showing here, whereas make panel is a method right here. We don't search through all the methods. That would be very annoying. If you want to search through all the methods, if you really want to do it, then you would go to the text version here. Pot this is one way, and do make panel. Pick pick panel, make panel. Anyway, there's a make panel, for instance. That, that's a full text search. But we're fine just popping over to the three here and seeing what the make panel can do. Texture active, texture actives, transparency, opacity, scale, and color space. Okay, use texture actives to make a panel based on that. Flip material, dispose, um, huh. So there's no, I could have sworn we had on the make panel some ability to do that. Let's just take a look at, oh, I can't look at the code. Okay, I can look at the code. It's just in another uh, library. Do you want to explore it? <laughs> You're going, no, no, I want to go to bed. All right, well, this could be something else we've forgotten, so uh, I think we should explore it. Let's explore. There's the game, there's physics. What do we want? We want three, so three, 2.3. Flip material, make panel, color space, scale, opacity, transparent, texture actives, texture active, texture actives. Yeah, so it's throwing in a texture active it is a basic material no matter what. All right, well, that's that's rather limiting, I suppose, for the panel. It may be that we want, uh, it, we're thinking that that's interface, usually an interface on panels, probably just want to see that all the time rather than have lighting on it. However, there might be some cases where it's handy to use, you can always make a plane, that, that's a thought. So if you don't want this default stuff, make a plane, it's, it's only, four or five more lines and you guys are really used to it. Guys and girls are really used to it in 3JS anyway. So go ahead and just make your own plane. So have a look at another explore and see how you can um, bring that in yourself there. Meanwhile, we will consider seeing if we want to have a parameter in there for the material type. I thought we did. Somewhere along the line we have parameter for not only material type, but things like um, transparency and stuff like that as a parameter. Where was that? I'll have to look into it. I don't, I don't see it in there, but well, whatever. Okay, so just a sim simply a make panel. We got some lights on that. That's for the phone. And then there's a throttle test. So <laughs> this is this is that time where it's, you know, it's an hour and a half gone by, an hour and 45 minutes. Like we're right near the end when we are scrambling around going, I thought we had that parameter. And then next we show you, oh, yes, here's the throttle test. So on older mobile, um, Android mobiles, we, we tried this on a five-year-old iPad 
and it worked like butter. It's as smooth as can be. But on some older Galaxy tab that we had, it was just too chuggy, like it didn't, it didn't run properly. So now it does though with this. Um, so what that is, is to get that texture to change, we have to cache constantly. So we're constantly caching as things are moving or animating, etc. And I guess the older Samsung just didn't like that caching, whereas everything else is fine with it. So we said if the frame rate, this is how we can get the frame rate. If the frame rate is less than 50, and what is, as well, we found it, it was like bogging so much that it didn't even report a proper frame rate, or like the frame rate was lower to start. Then as soon as it bogged, it didn't, the frame rate didn't seem to drop. It's still stuck in the 40s. And we're going, that's not a 40 frame rate. You know, we can, we can tell that's not a 40 frame rate, but it was reporting a 40 frame rate. And so anyway, uh, here we are just saying if it's starting off a little bit low, let's set it to 30. And as soon as we set it to 30, it half the caching and it, it's fine. It's like it doesn't look the greatest, but it's it's operable anyway. It's no problem. So like I said, on everything else, and as you can see here, we're seeing uh, just a fine frame rate on, on everything. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Which is super. And things will only get better as we move into the future. So there's our final little throttle test on there. And I I think that was it. We didn't miss anything, did we? So the texture actives, we make the canvas window. That's a mesh. So this returns a mesh, nice easy mesh. It just saves five lines. So have a look at the texture actives raw and you can see what those five lines are. It's the geometry, the texture, the material and the mesh. And this makes the mesh and we add the mesh. Do you see where we add the mesh? When the phone loads, Oh, we, we put it not on the scene. That's clever. Isn't that clever? So because we didn't put it on the scene, we actually put it in on the model. So that means we didn't, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to, it's just, well, does that, would that even matter? No, that wouldn't matter because we're only moving the camera anyway. But if we started animating the model, oh, we did animate the model. Yeah, that's right. We animated the model. That's why we had to do it. Okay, by animating that model, we want to put the texture active in the model. So there you go. Dum, dum, dum. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been... Dum, dum, dum. A Zim Explore. Oh my goodness. I'm Dr. Abstract. Hopefully you're still here with us. And if you want, you're welcome to join us at zimjs.com slash slack zimjs.com slash discord we'd love to talk to you and see how you're building with this and we'd love to welcome you into the zim world if you come from the 3js world and likewise we uh encourage all the zim people to hang out with uh with 3js for a while yeah cheers bye bye